So I would like to get started. So good afternoon. I'm Andrea Ruggeri, Director of the Center for International Studies and Professor of Political Science and National Relations at the University of Oxford. And today I have the honor to chair a round table celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Siri Foster Lecture. The topic that we will tackle with is reflecting on the advances of international relations. The 2020 has been an incredible year, a very demanding year. Um, everyone has experienced very different pressures and difficulties, has been a remarkable year for international relations. And we decided to go ahead, even if with just a digital format with the Siri Foster Lecture. We wanted to celebrate this lecture that is the most important lecture for international relations at Oxford. So we will reflect on the advances of international relations as object of study, but also as international relation as an academic discipline. Let me just briefly tell you what is the Cyril Foster Lecture Series. Over the past 60 years, the Cyril Foster Lecture Series has delivered engaging lectures from some of the world's most influential policymakers and academics. As I already mentioned, this is the university annual distinguished lecture in the field of international relations. This lecture series is the legacy of Cyril A. Foster. And we know very little about him. Mr. Foster owned several small sweet shops in and around London and lived alone in Essex. On his death, he left a bequest to the university asking us to create an annual lecture series on the elimination of war and the better understanding of the nation of the world. This wish is particularly unusual as he had no previous connection to the university at all. However, his kind and generous gift continues to promote international cooperation and lecturing, but also supporting our graduate students in attending international conferences. Previous speakers include prominent figures from the world of politics and policy. Oxford has hosted prime minister and foreign minister to secretary general of the United Nations and heads of major international organization, as well as prominent academics. Over the past 60 years, the international arena has changed remarkably. From a bipolar system defined by the race of two superpowers, we have moved between attempt of unipolarity and the diverse constellation of multipolarity. New actors are emerging and old ones are struggling for their positions. We have witnessed the colonization and an unprecedented number of sovereign, or someone argue, would argue semi-sovereign states. Many actors have been flourishing between this, above the states, international institutions, NGOs, transnational private firms, and transnational non-state actors. Trade and financial flows have been increasing, but also interstate conflict has been decreasing. However, we have experienced peaks of civil wars in the mid 90s and again today. Refugees flows have defined the recent years of international relations. We will reflect and the panelists will reflect on these different aspects as object of international relations, but also how the discipline has changed from paradigms and debates between approaches to different subfields and specialities with mid-range theories. Today, we have three outstanding panelists. We have Janina Dill, John J. Winant, Associate Professor of UN's Foreign Policy, University of Oxford, and Professorial Fellow at Nafid College. Rosemary Foot, Emeritus Professor of International Relations and Senior Research Fellow in the Department of Politics and International Relations. Adam Robert, Senior Research Fellow in International Relations at Bailey College and former 
Montague Barton Professor of International Relations at Oxford University. The round table, and by the way, this is the first round table in the history of the Cyril Foster Lectures, and indeed is the first digital event ever for the Cyril Foster Lecture, will have this structure. We'll have two main questions. And the first round, I will pose this question. What would you highlight as the main advances in our understanding of war and relation among the nation as IR discipline in the past 60 years? So the first round, the three panelists will have the opportunity to provoke us, to share their thoughts, and after their fantastic ideas, we will open the floor to a Q&A. However, being a digital roundtable, I will have to be the person trying to summarize the, the question you will pose as audience. So you can notice that there is a Q&A function and you can type your questions there. I will do my best to summarize and to put together questions under similar teams. Then we will move to the second round where again our panelists will tackle with another question. What do you think are the core challenges to order and cooperation in the international system now and the next future? And again, we will have the opportunity to have a brief Q&A. And so when you're typing your question, uh, please try to be brief to the point because as a chair, I will have to work very hard to try to let you all to pose questions, but thanks and buy up my voice. So let's get started with the first round that is about the advances of our understanding of war and relation among the nation as a yard discipline in the past 60 years. And I would ask Janina Deal to start as the first panelist. Thank you, Janina. Thank you, Andrea, for organizing this event and for inviting me to speak today. I have not been a scholar of international relations quite long enough to have first-hand insight into how the discipline has changed in the last 60 years. But like any research question, Andrea's prompt, what are the main advances in the study of war and peace in the last 60 years, can be approached systematically and from a distance. To start off our roundtable, I will trace three types of change to our field in the last 60 years, which can roughly be captured with the who, the how, and the what of studying war and peace in international relations. In other words, first, what are changes to our discipline? Who is studying war in what professional context? Second, changes to our methods. How do we study what we study? And third, changes to our substantive preoccupations. What do we think constitutes war in international relations? Where do we even look when we pick an object of investigation? I will highlight one important dimension of change for each of these three types, and I will offer a tentative normative assessment. Because not every change is an advance, and not every advance may be sufficiently bold to be cause for celebration. So let's start with who is studying war in what professional context changes to the discipline. The authors who published research articles in international organization in 1960 were Philip, Max, Robert, Leroy, William, Ernst, Uwe, Richard, Elliot, Norman, Harold, George, Lincoln, David, and Jose. The author's register looks barely different for the rest of the decade. It only slowly starts to change towards the end of the decade. Needless to say that in 2020, women published in top journals. Although this is harder to gauge from names alone, we also have a wider geographical representation and authorship in the major journals. Yet we clearly lack voice, still lack voices from the global south, which are underrepresented. The same goes for people of color and indeed for women. The Journal of Peace Research, one of the main journals studying war and peace, tracked its authorship over the first roughly 50 years of its existence and reported in its anniversary issue that the share of articles with one female author had risen from around 10% in its founding year of 1964 to just over 20% in 2010. An advance, yes, but one we want to celebrate. Measuring change in the discipline, who does conflict research and in what professional context, in a sense is fundamentally different from measuring change to our methods and concepts. Why? 
Because when it comes to change to the methods and concepts, we do not really know where the journey will take us. We do not have a clear normative idea of what should change. When it comes to the question of who should do conflict research in what professional context, the ideal is quite clear. Those with the best arguments, regardless of their background in race, gender, ethnicity, means, access should be heard. With this ideal in mind, even though the field bears little resemblance to 60 years ago, one might be permitted to conclude that things haven't advanced quite enough. Looking at author article authorship in 1960, what I found somewhat um, interesting or more unexpected than the largely male roster was actually how rare co-authorship was in those days. Clearly today it is the norm. And this brings me to the second type of change, our methods, how we study conflict. The way in which I was taught international relations, there was a clear story. First, there was qualitative IR scholarship in philosophy and history. And then there was a big turn and we all started counting things. Of course, if we look specifically at the last 60 years, and I did you know, with um, you know, some attention in the last week or so, the story is basically the reverse. In the early 1960s, quantitative conflict studies are really thriving. Two of the most important specialized journals, the Journal of Conflict Resolution and the Journal of Peace Research, are founded on just either side of 1960. The correlates of war project likewise emerges on the scene in 1964. And in general, the behavioral revolution firmly grips the social sciences. It takes, I believe, the late 1970s for the qualitative study of peace and conflict and war to come to equal prominence again, for instance, with the journal International Security founded in 1976. Of course, more important than this ebb and flow between quantitative and qualitative scholarship is that each of these approaches and with them formal modeling, game theory, historical and interpretive analyses, and slightly more recently experimental approaches have all enormously gained in sophistication over this time period. For scholars, that primarily means that it is increasingly difficult to be cutting edge of using more than one of these methods at the same time, which then encourages specialization and co-authorship. Specialization and methods pluralism, of course, bear some risks that the, danger, that the discipline fragments, the different subfields stop talking to each other, but surely with some effort, these can be avoided. Having been somewhat subdued or critical about um, how much cause for celebration we have when it comes to who studies IR, our first dimension of change, I would like to cast this increased method specialization and the sophistication that it reflects as unambiguously positive, a true advance. The study of war and of IR is at its best when it reflects the fact that not all aspects of social reality can meaningfully be grasped with one single set of tools. It is at its best when collectively we recognize that each of these methods is associated with meaningful but necessarily distinct standards of rigor. Now I ask you, am I wrong to think that over the last 60 years, maybe even just over the last 10 years, the field has moved out of food fight modus and into a more mature state of methods plurality? where the recognition prevails that applying any of these methods properly takes a lot of professional skill. And when applied properly, each has distinct insights to offer. Whether or not you share this positive assessment of advances in our methods, it seems undeniable that it has gone hand in hand with, and at least it has been fueled by a disaggregation of the phenomenon of war. Which brings me to the third type of change, our understanding of the phenomenon we study. In their respective anniversary issues, the Journal of Conflict Resolution and the Journal of Peace Research both state that they were firmly preoccupied with interstate war, even great power war, when they were first founded, not surprising in the 1960s. They both report the discovery of the importance of intrastate and civil wars in the 1980s and 90s, terrorism, non-state and one-sided violence in the 2000s, and more recently, the study of crime and nonviolent resistance movements. The development of international law has mirrored this disaggregation of the phenomenon of war in a very interesting way. For the longest time, international law regulated war between states with only a fairly weak attempt to uphold minimum humanitarian standards in a residual category called armed conflicts not of an international character. It started regulating non-international armed conflicts systematically only in the 1970s. We have since had a bifurcated legal regime with international armed conflict on one side and non-international armed conflict on the other side. Of course, in recent decades, a number of phenomena have challenged this bifurcation. The so-called global war on terror between a state and various non-state armed groups operating on the territory of states not themselves involved in the war. 
the spillover of civil wars into neighboring states, for instance, in the African Great Lakes region, states intervening in the internal armed conflicts of other states, often on the side of the non-state armed group, armed violence solely among non-state actors that rises to the level of armed conflicts, partly because it is intertwined um, with organized crime. All of these phenomena have challenged this dichotomy in which we supposedly just have what two types of armed conflict. In a recent book on the applicability of the laws of war or international humanitarian law, I had occasion to attempt to formulate a typology of armed conflicts. And I came up with six types of armed conflict, not including all the types of political violence that fall below the threshold at which the laws of war start applying. Now, it might be uncontroversial that this unpacking of the phenomenon of war, this diversification in the conceptualization of conflict is an advance. War in the real world is multifaceted and so surely must be our conceptualization of it. Of course, this raises the question of what the boundaries of the concept are, um, you know, and as a result, the boundaries of the field and the boundaries of legitimate inquiry. Polemically put, do we still know what war is? Are nonviolent resistance movements not lacking a necessary feature? Is the war on terror a war, even though it supposedly takes place every day, everywhere? And what about the war on the virus? Was vaccination day last week the day? Are we hopelessly overstretching our central concept? There is no easy answer here other than the trivial but comforting insight that this is not a new question. This is not a problem that somehow the complexity of the 21st century has thrown at us. In the 1970s, the rise to prominence of the concept of structural violence and with it the notion of a positive peace raised much the same question. All I would like to submit to you is that having to ask the question, where does war end? What is conflict? How do we define peace? Is not itself a failing or an indication that we move around in circles or have failed to make advances. It is one of our core tasks to define and redefine the core traits of the phenomenon we study and to struggle with the question of which of the many real world phenomena that we observe share the family resemblance. The opposite of too broad a concept of war, too narrow a concept of war, um, strikes me as much more dangerous. Say if there were corners of the discipline where scholars sought to limit war worthy of study to the violent struggle between great powers. This would obscure too much of a complex reality and indeed it would lead to a partial and exclusionary scholarly discourse. In other words, it would be a symptom of a lack of advances on the axis of change we discussed first. Who studies conflict and in what professional context? Let me conclude. I believe the changes to the field of IR in the last 60 years, specifically in the study of war and peace, are a story of specialization, of diversification and of increased pluralism in the methods with which we study war and in the way in which we conceive of the phenomenon. Yes, methodological and substantive specialization, diversification and pluralism carry risks, risks of fragmentation and overstretch. But in the first instance, their benefit by far outweigh these risks. This pump becomes all too obvious when we look at changes to who studies conflict and in what professional context and must conclude that here, the diversification and pluralism gained in the last 60 years still falls short. Thanks. Thank you very much, Janina. Um, I would like to ask Rosemary um, to please uh, share with us your insights. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Andrea, for inviting me to participate in this. I've often been in the audience for a Cyril Foster lecture, but I've never actually had the honour of uh, doing uh, making a contribution to that lecture. So thank you very much for that. And my approach to the question is really to pick up on one um, among many of the silences, if you like, the absences within the IR discipline over the past 60 years. And I'm going to engage with some real world phenomena to try and try and in, to illustrate that. I mean, Janine is very helpful overview actually has already done some of it, particularly in, in her who question. Um, but I want to refer yet again on the sort of the US centric Eurocentric nature of IR scholarship over the course of the last six decades. Um, and to illustrate it and to remedy that to some degree, I want to try and build my remarks around examples from the Asia Pacific. Uh, and link some of those examples to developments within the UN in reference to its conceptualization of threats to international peace and security. So again, it draws on what Janina has been saying about pluralism um, uh, in, in terms of the, the reference point and so on. So I want to think about war 
and mass violence in the Asia Pacific over the last six decades and to note that the experience of violence in the region doesn't seem to have been much of a prompt to the UN's later adoption of a far broader understanding of, of which instances of harm uh, actually represent threats to international peace and security. But I also want to suggest that the Asia Pacific region may play an oversized role in narrowing once again that broader understanding of what constitutes a proper role for the Security Council in dealing with security threats. So I'm, what I'm trying to do, I think, is to suggest that one major factor shaping IR as a discipline and as a policy field has been generalization based on a narrow conception of what's global and which areas of the world are worthy of study in order to forge the various generalized theories that we have. So let me begin with a, a, a brief discussion of some of the features of the Asia Pacific region 60 years ago. I mean, very much the case that the focus of attention was on the Vietnam War and the US role in that conflict. So Vietnam was discussed very much as a proxy war, uh, a hot war during the Cold War, rather than as a conflict that was typical of an era of decolonization an era in which states hadn't yet established political direction, hadn't yet settled on a post-colonial identity, hadn't consolidated, and thus were often engulfed in eruptions of mass violence. And this type of fragility affected many parts of the Asia Pacific region. In fact, Alex Bellamy's calculated that 80% of the world's mass atrocities occurred in East Asia at the height of the Cold War. I mean, you can think of Indonesia, 1965-66, where mass violence was used by the army to wipe out those suspected of being communists. Um, something like half a million to 650,000 people massacred over a relatively short space of time. Or Cambodia under Pol Pot, 1975-79, where the killings reached nearly 2 million Cambodians. Now that attracted the label of genocide, but little or no reaction on those grounds in response to that label of genocide. So the Soviet Soviets took one side, the United States and China took another side in that particular um, part of the world. The Vietnamese, the Vietnamese government that intervened in 1979 was actually condemned by the UN Security Council for using force against the Cambodian regime. Thirteen members uh, voted to condemn Vietnam, only the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia civil supported Vietnamese intervention. And Vietnam itself didn't justify its use of force on humanitarian grounds or on grounds of international humanitarian law. So the idea of human protection wasn't yet on the UN's agenda and it would take until the late 1990s, the outbreaks of violence in the Balkans in particular, as well as Rwanda, before Secretary General Kofi Annan would actually launch his famous discussion on two concepts of sovereignty, offer his reading of the UN Charter, that it was meant to protect individuals from abuse, not to protect those who abused them. So those earlier Asian examples of egregious breaches of international humanitarian law didn't have the impact one might have expected. They couldn't pierce understandings of how states through an organization like the UN should address instances of mass civilian in harm. And that obviously that was in large part because they were caught up in superpower competition during the so-called Cold War. And yet there was perhaps one way um, in which uh, the conflicts did have an impact, at least where the Pol Pot and Cambodian example is concerned. And that's the way it shaped Gareth Evans, a former Cyril Foster lecturer, by the way, who as a young student had traveled extensively in Cambodia and then discovered later on that many of the friends he made during that conflict had all been, uh, it, many of the friends he'd made during his travels in that country had all been killed. Now he became subsequently the Australian foreign minister but important for me and where I'm trying to go in this short presentation is that he co-chaired the Canadian sponsored International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. And that produced a report, Sovereignty as Responsibility, forming the basis of the norm of the responsibility to protect. The idea that a responsible 
sovereign state had a duty to protect its peoples from mass atrocity crimes. So um, the idea of human protection begins to emerge and several UN secretaries general, which as you said, Andrea, have given the Cyril Foster lecture at Oxford, um, have alluded to this. Um, they've advanced the idea that the UN actually existed to protect human beings from violence, not those that abused them. The UN shouldn't just focus on interstate war, on state security, but actually on human security and on what was happening inside states as well as outside of states. So Boutros Ghali in 96 focused on what he called the disease of civil conflict arising from the uneven effects of globalization. And he tried to make the case that there would be consequences for international peace and security were the disease of civil conflict be allowed to rage unchecked across wide areas of the world. I'm quoting him then. And he also tried to make the solidarist case that lives lost in one place shouldn't matter less than lives lost in another. And then Kofi Annan in 2001 took this a bit further. He talked about democracy as an international issue, making the point that democratic governance, the realization of human rights were essential ingredients in order to bring about stable peace, both domestically as well as internationally. So he too was saying that international peace and domestic peace were related and that the UN had to turn away from its focus on interstate war to incorporate the idea that mass violence against individuals inside states should be a concern for all those working to maintain international peace and security. We'll forever associate Kofi Annan, I think, with ideas of responsible sovereignty, the movement towards the responsibility to protect, the idea that peace operations should have as a core obligation the protection of civilians in armed conflict, and the notion that conflict disproportionately affected women, and that women's empowerment in decision-making roles as peacekeepers, peacemakers, would be a way of addressing that. So his was an era when the idea of human protection seemed to be consolidating. And then when Ban Ki-moon gave his Cyril Foster lecture in 2011, he called it actually human protection and the 21st century United Nations. He spent much of that lecture talking about the UN role in human protection and that it had become a core goal of the UN. He also asked whether the Security Council had gone too far in its insistence on human protection as a core obligation of the organization. And he answered that it had not gone too far. But five years later in 2016, exhausted as he was by the failure to stop the widespread atrocities that were happening in Syria in particular, one of his final speeches at the UN, he said, I'm just going to quote him if I can find it. Over the past few years, we have drifted off track, threatening to reverse years of progress. The frequency and scale of atrocity crimes have increased and will likely continue to do so unless the international community takes more determined and consistent action to fulfill its responsibility to protect. Now that speech actually makes for pretty grim reading and it may it's clear that it's been very difficult to actually consolidate the human protection norm. Um, and in some ways it suggests, doesn't it, that whether the arc of moral, the moral universe is bending over time towards justice, to coin a phrase, is actually up for, for serious debate. So at the moment we see a distinct moving away from this idea of civil war, um, what's happening inside states and what's happening outside states, we see a moving away from that to some degree. And why is that? It's because obviously of the continuing power of the alternative norm, sovereign equality, non-interference in internal affairs. And if I continue with my Asia Pacific theme a bit, this norm of sovereign equality and non-interference continues to have attraction in Asia Pacific states and particularly for China a permanent member of the Security Council and therefore in a very major position to influence uh, UN policy and doctrines. States in this region don't champion R2P. They, very few of them appointed a focal point person in reference to R2P. Relatively few have established national bodies to oversee protection of women's rights or human rights 
And yet it's an area of the world that's recognized as vital in the transition of global order. It's being depicted regularly as the center of gravity of the world's economy and therefore a growing influence in world politics. So it's likely, I think, if we speculate about the future, that governments in that region are gonna add weight to the argument that the liberal internationalism of the 1990s and early 2000s was perhaps more than the traffic could bear. And I don't say that with any relish whatsoever. So my overall point, I suppose, is to suggest that Global IR is a project worthy of pursuit. And secondly, it is what is going on inside states that should have been a more uh, prominent area of, dis of study for the discipline of IR over the last six days, especially for those concerned about understanding the eruption of violence that has global implications. But all the time, that domestic context has had to fight hard to get the attention of positivist, structural, social sciences scientists who've had effectively a leading role in the profession. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Andrea. Well, thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, before I'll ask Adam to uh, join uh, the round table uh, with his comments, I would just remind you that if you want to pose question, please use the Q&A function. So please, Adam, would you like to uh, unmute your microphone and, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea, for uh, all your organization of this event. Um, I want, first of all, to react to what we've just heard from Janina and Rosemary. Uh, it strikes me that both of them uh, presented to us uh, something which I think is uh, particularly well developed at Oxford, but by no means unique here, which is uh, a mixture of uh, recognition of the importance of principle, ideology, ideas, and so on, with um, also um, an understanding of the facts of power politics. Uh, and indeed, dare I say it, Rosemary came close to saying it, um, the uh, elements of eternal truth in some realist doctrines, which is not to say that they have a monopoly on the truth. Indeed, uh, I think it would be fair to interpret what I've got to say as an attempt to break down that barrier between realism on the one hand with its focus on power politics and interest as enduring factors in international relations uh, and uh, other considerations uh, um, on the other now um, in incidentally such a realist approach also has some in, uh, application within states and i think one of the many lessons that we have learned in the last few decades and that came out very clearly from both Rosemary's and, and uh, Janina's uh, presentations was precisely the uh, importance of not having a mental barrier, a rigid mental barrier between one's understanding of international events and internal events within states. Uh, and indeed, Sometimes it, it has been the case in uh, many times in the last uh, half century uh, when, uh, at least in particular areas, international relations seemed a rather more civilized uh, here, uh, area of operations than uh, internal conflicts within states. So uh, that, that's an underlying theme that I very much agree with, and I also want to. Uh, emphasize that I agree with what Rosemary said about the centrality of decolonization as an issue that has been facing states. Um, and there was a tendency, I can recall aspects of it in the curriculum when I came to uh, Oxford in the early 80s, there was a tendency to treat uh, most conflicts in most parts of the world as somehow an emanation of the Cold War. Uh, and there was very little recognition of the, of the independent autonomous character of many conflicts, 
and the way in which, in fact, many post-colonial states fa face problems which we ourselves face. Um, the, the question of uh, the status of Ireland, which has been so deep in recent uh, years because of uh, the implications of um, Brexit for Ireland, uh, that's that's an absolutely classic post-colonial uh, issue, and uh, every single one of the UN um, interventions in conflict through peacekeeping operations is in a post-colonial situation. Has been every one of them. So uh, I think that's an element that has somehow uh, not received quite the attention that it deserves, and certainly not quite the attention in public statements of officials, foreign ministers and the like, where they prefer explanations of a simpler kind, which involve uh, attacking some demon, some preferred demon or another. Now, um, beyond these few observations on what we've just heard from Rosemary, I want to uh, illustrate what I think about the development of international relations, both the subject and uh, international relations out there, um, by referring to uh, some aspects of the Zero Foster Lectures. And I want to start with the uh, element of international society, which has been such a mark of the study of the subject at Oxford, uh, and where Hedley Bull left a um, uh, major contribution with his uh, book on the anarchical society. That's um, a uh, theme that one can find reflected in uh, many of the uh, Sarah Foster lectures. And I think it's, a, it's been an important one. Now, um, on more specific themes, more directly related to policy actions. Um, the nuclear revolution and arms control, uh, the uh, developments in this field, which date very much from the early 1960s and thereafter, uh, they were reflected in uh, an early Cyril Foster lecture, the one in 1964, given by uh, Pat Blackett. Um, he was a Nobel Prize winner for physics uh, and was an advisor to the Wilson government in the UK and had a powerful influence on Br the British emphasis on arms control uh, at the time. So um, he was giving a lecture on what are the prospects for disarmament. Now I generally dislike titles with the word prospects in uh, or future of, but uh, that was the right subject to be discussing at that time. Uh, and uh, incidentally, of course, it's worth remembering that it was around that time also that uh, Hedley Bull uh, got employed rather improbably uh, by the Foreign Office to uh, be an advisor on arms control, he having written the book, The Control of the Arms Race. So that was an important issue. And I emphasize it now because we have been during the Trump administration attending a sort of festival of uh, burning of arms control agreements. And uh, it's an issue which we're going to need to come back to quite a lot in the next few years, because what we'll not do is simply to try and recreate existing or abandoned agreements uh, and uh, uh, make a carbon copy of them and sign them again. That, that uh, uh, will not be enough because the circumstances have changed. And in particular, the number of great powers, nuclear powers with large arsenals is uh, far more than the simple two. Uh, and uh, was, uh, is, uh, that imposes a requirement for a different type of arms control regime in, in many cases. But uh, that's a specific issue that was well addressed in the uh, uh, Cyril Foster lectures. Another thing I'd like to emphasize 
and I think it's uh, something that does sometimes get neglected in the teaching of international relations is the emphasis on international history as something that informs how different countries see the world, uh, they, how, how their experiences influence them. This uh, is uh, still a, a very important insight and it's also worth recalling how many issues that we think of as relatively new in international relations, uh, like civil war and so on, also have a very long history. Uh, and it was quite an aberration, uh, that period that Janina described so well, uh, when it was thought that all war was international war, or all we needed to worry about uh, was the international. That's, uh, we're in another era now. On the subject of international history, I cannot avoid recalling that uh, when uh, in uh, 19, uh, 1990 it was, Krzysztof Skubiszewski, the foreign minister of Poland, uh, gave a lecture uh, on contemporary Europe. I'm afraid he was Eurocentric, but I think as foreign minister of Poland in 1990, he was entitled to be. Um, he uh, made a very witty, pertinent observation at the beginning of his lecture when he said, there he was standing on this big podium at the end of the room in uh, this huge room, examination schools. Uh, and he said, I find myself standing to give this lecture between portraits of the Tsar of Russia and the Kaiser of, of Germany. He said, this is a thoroughly familiar situation for Poland. Um, I think that he brought a, a, a remarkable perspective, not only as an international lawyer, but as uh, somebody with a deep knowledge of international history to that lecture. And when you think that lecture was given when the Soviet Union was still there, before the German treaty had been negotiated, uh, it was quite an achievement to set out uh, a clear vision of how Poland might uh, uh, operate successfully its relations with its neighbors. And I have to say, I think he made a better job of it uh, and a better job of unification, of, of responding to the unification of Germany uh, than uh, did our own prime minister. Um, now, uh, I also want to uh, say one thing about the, the outcomes of Cyril Foster lectures, which is we had uh, at least three books emerging out of it. One was a book called United Nations Divided World. I'll say no more about it other than that the title I think reflects that combination of recognition of the importance of internationalism with a dose of realism. Uh, but secondly, um, Headley Bull's edited volume on intervention in world politics, which resulted from a Cyril Foster lecture series in 82 uh, and was published a couple of years later, and which is very good at relating contemporary justifications for intervention to the earlier history of thought about the subject. Uh, and thirdly, uh, Pat Moynihan's book on pandemonium, um, published in 1991. He, uh, as you know, US uh, senator, devoted extraordinary effort to writing this book. Um, he rang me up almost every other day or sent me telegrams, which tells you how long ago it was, about what he should include in his lecture. And he turned up with a 198 page manuscript for his lecture. Um, that uh, uh, those 198 pages were full of the history of the difficult issue of national self-determination. And I think it's quite remarkable uh, that he, um, uh, a supposedly busy US Senator, uh, should have produced that book in the short time frame that he did. Uh, before, for example, uh, uh, the uh, war in Yugoslavia had really uh, got going, uh, but he foresaw some of the hazards that were arising uh, in uh, that area. Um, now, 
rather than witter on about uh, past uh, uh, Cyril Foster lectures, and I could do that a bit, but uh, rather than that, I think it would be better for me to suggest that uh, I should come back to the issue of Europe and Eurocentrism in the second part and leave it now for the question and answer the first section. Thank you very much. So either if we are back, uh, moving back to uh, recording. So here is our second round. And the question I asked the panelists to uh, answer is, what do you think are the core challenges to order and cooperation in the international system now and the next future? And we will follow again the same order. So Janina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrea. There is a conventional story of what the challenges to order and cooperation in the international system are. These challenges stem from what distinguishes the international system from a well-ordered and peaceful domestic society. In the ideal type of a domestic society, we have a monopoly on the use of force and basic value consensus. In the international system, in contrast, we have anarchy and value plurality. I will say very little about various attempts to mitigate anarchy through the building of international institutions in the post-1945 era and the very hotly debated diagnosis that these international institutions are now in trouble. This is not because I think institutions are not important, they're vital. It is because I believe that the second element, international value plurality and a basic value consensus in spite of it, is what makes these institutions possible. A basic value consensus has given these institutions some limited effectiveness and threats to this value consensus are, I submit to you, the core challenge to these institutions and thus the core challenge to order and cooperation in the future. What do I mean by value consensus? At its heart lies an agreement on what Henry Hsu in his seminal book of the same title called Basic Rights. The proposition that every person, no matter where in the world, has a justified demand to enjoy security, subsistence and participation. The understanding that these are entitlements that need to be effectively protected against standard threats so that individuals can actually enjoy them. Effectively guaranteeing basic rights in Shu's words is a moral minimum, the lower limit of tolerable human conduct. The international system is a morally diverse place, this insight is trite. But valuable diversity is not threatened by a consensus on the goal to guarantee global basic rights to everyone because to borrow words attributed to Amartya Sen, it is not particularly odd to suggest that almost everyone would prefer to be alive rather than dead, free rather than imprisoned, secure rather than tortured, fed rather than hungry. How exactly institutions are designed and policies articulated that achieve global peace and cooperation leaves room for reasonable disagreement. But the guarantee of global basic rights ought to be the guiding aim of institution building and policy articulation that need not be questioned and should not be compromised. Someone sympathetic to the idea of universal basic rights as the central goal of international peace and cooperation may interject here and say, well, never mind future challenges to basic rights. We never actually got very far in truly guaranteeing basic rights to everyone. They would not be wrong. We have never lived in an era in which most people in most places of the world actually enjoyed security, subsistence and meaningful participation. However, I think an even more fundamental challenge to basic rights is afoot than the persistent challenge to their implementation. That is a challenge to their validity, to the value consensus that I mentioned earlier. This challenge has many different guises, but two in particular stand out. One challenge comes in the very familiar guise of moral and cultural relativism. When we took up serious human rights violations to cultural difference or to matters of state's internal concern. More recently, this challenge has also taken the guise of a wholesale dismissal of liberalism, which goes far beyond the legitimate critique of its overbearing dark side or institutional failings. The second challenge to the value consensus around basic rights is less direct, but no less pernicious. It comes in the guise of the so-called post-truth zeitgeist and the notion that every argument is equally legitimate and has equal authority. The pervasive sense that we have somehow lost the ability to adjudicate between truth claims, between true and alternative facts, between valid and invalid normative claims. Global communication technology, 24-hour news cycles, and social media may once have promised to democratize speech and access to information. We must now conclude that they also allow trolls, interest groups, and authoritarian regimes to weaponize speech, sow disinformation, and undermine trust in democracy, as well as faith in science. 
From Duterte to Putin, from Assad to Xi, the argument of choice to address criticism of horrific human rights abuses is now that they are fake news, glaring evidence to the country notwithstanding. One important indicator of this threat to the global value consensus is a crisis of international law. When it comes to measuring states' compliance with international law and thus the health of the global legal order, we naturally are particularly interested in the United States, or at least we used to, as a supposed guarantor of the current rules-based international order. If we systematically compare the outgoing to previous US administrations, their respective record of compliance with international law differs less than we may think. I work in particular on international law and the use of force from human rights law to international humanitarian and criminal law and the law on the resort to force. None of the previous administrations have anywhere near a spotless record of conformity with these bodies of law. The notion that the United States has only recently forsaken us, its place as exemplary member of a rule governed international order is therefore incorrect. Yet what has changed between the last four years and how US administrations behaved beforehand is how non-compliance with international law is framed and explained. Take some of the most egregious cases of deviance from the substantive propositions of international law of the second Bush administration, I mean the second President Bush. Extraordinary rendition, enhanced interrogation, and the invasion of Iraq. A salient feature of all of them, indeed part of what makes these policies insidious, is their level of legalization, the bureaucratic and political effort to frame them as compliant. The Obama administration appears to have fewer cases of high-profile deviance from its legal obligations. This impression is partly due to a much smarter approach to translating existing legal rules from one context to another making the case that practices that at face value push legal limits are in fact legal. Framing targeted killings outside areas of active hostilities as legal is one example of a strategy that former Assistant Secretary of State Harold Coe explicitly called translate and leverage, translate and leverage legal rules. Now let's compare both the ham-fisted Bush era and the subtler Obama era strategies of making international law work for policies that substantively defy the law spirit, sometimes even its letter to instances of legal defiance associated with the last four years. In some sense, the now outgoing US administration has done more to rhetorically challenge international law than to substantively deviate from it. You may all recall the calls for a renewal of waterboarding or for targeting terrorists, the families of terrorists, the dismissal of the Geneva Conventions as a politically correct way of fighting wars. International law was also conspicuously absent from the public pronouncements of this administration about possibly invading countries as diverse as Venezuela and Iran. Some of these, the outgoing president's impulses to undercut international law have not borne fruit. For instance, as far as we know, political appointees have showed deference to the prohibition on torture over the last four years. Other pronouncements defying international law have, however, left imprints in reality. We already talked about the um, bonfire of arms control treaties. But for instance, also the UN mission in Afghanistan reported that in the first half of 2019, in a stunning reversal of decade-long trends, more civilian casualties of direct war-related violence were caused by coalition troops in Afghanistan than by anti-government forces, something that was linked to policy changes that may well have challenged international law. Now, cloaking violations of international law and legal language is corrosive in its own way. It is not at all trivial. However, openly defying the authority of international law is not only a problem because of the associated conduct and the potential weakening of the law that it causes. It is also a symptom and a catalyst of the challenge to the global value consensus, the moral minimum on which much of the attempt to mitigate anarchy through institution building since roughly 1945 has depended. The open advocacy for disregarding international law and for conduct that implies a breach of individual's basic rights by someone in a unique position of authority as the American president is also in itself a heavy blow to this value consensus. How significant is the challenge to the value consensus that sustains global basic rights, which is a core challenge to peace and security co of cooperation now and in the future? One crucial indicator for the resilience of this consensus is how various audiences react to statements and policies that openly defy it. In my own research with collaborators of different institutions, we have found a remarkable public resonance of basic legal principles, for instance, around the protection of civilians in war. But we have also found clear pressure points on ordinary citizens' preferences for rights-respecting policies. 
For instance, the abstract proposition that innocent bystanders to political violence should be protected is very widely internalized in various societies that I have studied from the United States, Afghanistan, Israel to the United Kingdom. However, when it comes to protecting the innocent in foreign countries at the cost of lives to compatriots, or when it comes to recognizing the injustices perpetrated by one's own government as a threat to the rights of others, our commitments to the universality of basic rights proves less than resilient. As scholars of international relations, um, you know, we won't be the ones to build the institutions or articulate the policies that secure basic rights and shore up or rebuild this morally minimal consensus, even if we heed Adam's um, call to engage more with the policy world. However, what we can definitely do is study the conditions of possibility under which individuals form preferences for policies that sustain the rights of others. We can study when and under what conditions arguments about international law carry weight. Where are people, when are people open to listen to experts? What sustains their trust in democratic institutions? Studying these and other questions not only requires a variety of methods and the insight of adjacent disciplines such as psychology, philosophy, history, and law. It also requires an extremely broad understanding of conflict and war, as starting ultimately with individual attitudes. War, I submit to you, starts with nothing much more than individuals' doubt of the fundamental truth that everyone everywhere should have the effective enjoyment of basic rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we're moving to Rosemary. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, Janina is always such a difficult act to follow, but um, I'm gonna make a, a series of points again grounded in current political and policy problems and again that link the domestic with the global level. So what, the basic thing of what I'm going to say is about um, the challenges to order and, com and cooperation come from a combination of the complex makeup of the crises associated with the global commons that we face at the moment. And those are occurring at the same time with, that we're undergoing a transition in global order and experiencing a question of domestic governance models or dominant domestic governance models. So the obvious thing to say, first of all, is that the difficulties of agreement are compounded by the diffusion of power in the global system. And that's coupled with a kind of incomplete, contested incorporation of political actors um, with perhaps different values, different visions, different interests. So incomplete um, and incorporation of actors within the extant multilateral organizations. So that means that we have questions about who takes the leadership role then in these circumstances. What authority would they have to take on that role? And so it suggests that we're in an era where reform of multilateral institutions or the building of new multilateral institutions in order to to make new collective arrangements, that's going to be severely constrained. The search for sort of grand bargains is going to be really difficult um, in, in today's world and in the future. And perhaps more than this, we should understand this loss of confidence um, as coming from a kind of a deeper failure of the Enlightenment project itself, which has led to increased attention to a domestic governance model that's built on what is sometimes called these days performative legitimacy. And that's obviously that's related also to the COVID-19 um, um, crisis. Rather than models that are based on dem democratic legitimacy or representational uh, legitimacy. So there are real alternative domestic governance models that are out there and are being debated and examined in a way and that, that wasn't true of the recent past. And attitudes and arguments about domestic governance are obviously affecting domestic politics in a very serious way, particularly leading to a rise in populist sentiment. So we have populism, which has a leftist form, which has a rightist form. It's become a significant political force almost everywhere. Um, the populists are said to be united in this kind of belief that a country's true people are locked in a moral conflict with outsiders, where outsiders are defined in various different ways. And so the true people are supposed to be this homogenous grouping with a 
supposedly very clear set of identified and agreed interests. And those interests uh, are seen as the only legitimate source of political authority. And so these particular political actors are unwilling to accept constraints on the sovereignty of the state, only wanting to come together under a narrow version of locally determined solutions. And obviously they've again, they've affected responses to things like COVID-19. They've led to the wounding decision by the UK itself to come out of the EU in search of this chimera of, of sovereign control. So international cooperation, multilateral solutions don't appeal to populists. Uh, they don't appeal to the 74 million people that supported Trump or Modi or Bolsonaro or Johnson or Salvini, among others. And even if you're not a populist per se, if you're President Macron, for example, you may decide to take up populist themes for electoral reasons because that sentiment is out there and it's powerful. Another angle here to consider is the return of geopolitics. And obviously, again, this has a lot to do with Sino-American relations. It has a lot to do with power transition and with the kinds of policies that the resurgent China has introduced. And I'm gonna just briefly illustrate this with respect to the Belt and Road Initiative. So for those in the international system that have adopted this geopolitical perspective on world politics, the BRI represents, is put forward as important additional leverage for a state like China, which already has plenty of leverage. It's the second largest economy in the world, the largest trading partner for two thirds, three quarters of the world's economies. And some would argue that the Belt and Road has been set up as the first stage in the China-centric world, a world that leads to the promotion of Chinese norms, regulatory standards, with China as a hub, essentially, and the rest of the world outside China as spokes. And we've already seen that the Belt and Road is capable of diminishing levels of regional cooperation. Um, that's been true in the case of EU member states, uh, Hungary, Greece and Italy have all signed up to Belt and Road and that contradicts the European Commission position that the bloc should remain aloof unless the BRI's approach begins to confirm, conform more, more closely to preferences for transparency, openness, financial, environmental sustainability. And that means um, the one consequence has been that among EU member states, they haven't always become, been able to reach a collective position on aspects of Chinese foreign policy. So EU statements critical, for example, of human rights inside China and its support uh, for positions overseas, it hasn't been possible to, to find a collective position among EU member states. And at least as important to my geopolitical theme, of course, is the deterioration in US-China relations. And that's important because it affects their ability to cooperate in a number of multi multilateral venues. And we're seeing this particularly within the UN, which is pretty central as a convening location for many of the shared fate issues that we're confronted with. Um, and moreover, those issues have often been listed as forming a possible basis for managing China-US conflict. But those issues have actually moved on. So if you think about reconstituting the Iran nuclear deal, that has moved on into a different place as a result of the, the breakdown on elements of that and, and, and the enrichment that has gone on inside Iran. Or nuclear program in North Korea, for example, again, that's moved on, that's advanced. Or cooperation by the World Health Organization over this health pa pa pandemic, let alone any future ones. Now, now that looks much more difficult. Even climate change, which is often chosen as the, um, the, the one major sort of bright spot in ways of managing US-China conflict, that's, that's going to be more difficult because of China's decisions already taken to, if you like, steal a march here and set its own carbon intensity targets and so on. Um, so it's already moved beyond a position where it has to, it can manage this uh, via, via an agreement with the United States to actually put out there in the global community uh, its own position on ideas of, of, of climate change and, and carbon intensity.
And then there's the more general issue anyway of whether the state, um, like China and many others, can trust what the US negotiates in 2021 and 2022. Can it trust that it will last when the next US administration comes to power, whatever that might be? It was recently put to me in a, um, a Zoom webinar that under President Obama, US policy with respect to China was to cooperate where we can, confront where we must, and that under Trump, it became confront where we can, in other words, reflecting increases in China's overall capability, and cooperate where we must. So uh, this is a kind of a continuum, we can think about this as a kind of continuum in the China-US relationship. Uh, and where Biden will sit along that continuum, it seems to me is not quite clear. Whatever his preference is anyway, he has to deal with the fact of a polarized US society and a host, hostile US Senate. Um, wherever he ends up, uh, the areas of cooperation among the two most important states in the global system are likely to be small and the process difficult. And Biden may be too taken up with the idea of establishing a club of democracies, which I think will raise new difficulties of deciding who is in and who is out of that club. And it should lead us to ask questions such as, do we want club-led solutions or do we want inclusiveness in, in participation? And on the Chinese side, we have yet other challenges in that its concept of multilateralism and multilateral cooperation is a very thin one in my view and its preference remains very much for nationally determined solutions. Whatever President Xi may say at Davos or at the United Nations, it's the national level that is so important when China thinks about its particular conception of world order. So for some uh, IR scholars, IR theorists, um, at least those that focus on state-to-state -state relations, the preoccupation is likely to be, if you're a constructivist, why, despite China's deeper integration into many aspects of current norm-based international society, the socialization of China hasn't occurred to the degree uh, we would have expected. What does it mean that alternative normative frameworks are going to be floated and some of them may well prosper? And if it's, if it's neo-realist, it might be, are we in a bipolar moment? And what does that mean for cooperation compared with, say, a unipolar or multipolar system, sort of things you started with, Andrea, in your opening remarks? But international historians, they ask questions about whether we're in a new Cold War um, or not. And if we are, is there anything we can learn from the coexistence strategies of that era to manage um, coexistence in the current period. But there are also, as I've suggested again, as in the first part of the presentation and now again in this one, there are also domestically driven understandings of where we are with respect to cooperation. So we need to pay close attention to developments inside the US, inside China, as well as inside other societies for clues as to what might be possible at the global level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. So, uh, Adam, would you like would like to join us on this uh, looking to the future and the challenges? Indeed. Uh, I'll, I'll if if uh, following Janina is difficult, following Janina and Rosemary is doubly difficult. Uh, especially, it's a devilish problem when you agree with everything that they have said. Um, but I'll just confine my remarks, if I may, to. Uh, three topics. Uh, one is the role of great powers, which both of them have touched on in uh, the uh, current and future international system. Uh, secondly, uh, will be the question of tackling uh, urgent environmental issues and the, the problems that poses for the, uh, how we have, do we have the tools necessary for tackling that issue. Um, and thirdly, uh, I will say a word about Europe. Uh, on the first, great powers, uh, which comes back to a question that I think uh, Edward Mortimer asked. Uh, it seems to me that great powers 
uh, have always existed in some form, uh, but the forms vary. And sometimes the language for them varies as often as the language used in Britain for lunatic asylums has varied. Uh, they're just called, called by different names. Sorry. Um, so uh, I was very struck reading about the revolutionary years in France uh, that they threw their weight about in Europe by making arrangements with sister states. And the implication was France was the great mother state uh, and they would all happily support it and indeed pay for the privilege and they were asked to pay a great deal. That was one form of being a great power while pretending not to be. Uh, and likewise, we know from America's history in the interwar years, uh, um, the United States made a, a heroic effort to be a great power that wasn't a great power and it wasn't a great success either. But uh, it, it's an ever shifting uh, pattern and it, it does appear to be very difficult to, to uh, escape from the notion that there are some superior powers that have a more important role than uh, other powers. Uh, and we have just witnessed in recent months, for example, um, the uh, defeat uh, uh, of, um, sorry, uh, the, the defeat of Armenia in the war with Azerbaijan uh, in a way that the outside world has scarcely noticed. Uh, it's been an absolutely major defeat of a country that had hitherto enjoyed friendly relations with the West. Azerbaijan seems to be emerging as uh, a more significant power in the region and uh, alas we don't seem to be in a position to do anything about this resurgence of, of uh, power politics. So um, there, there is an enduringly difficult question. And you hinted, Rosemary, at how the Obama administration addressed the problem. Uh, actually, uh, it's, it's often been addressed by uh, uh, that problem of disguising your role as a great power um, by major governments. And Obama himself, um, was more involved in uh, secret assassinations than any uh, president, any other president of the United States, as far as I, I know. So it, it's, um, uh, it's a very hard thing to get away from, whatever the rhetoric or the intentions. And um, uh, that's one of the issues that we certainly need to look at. Now, on the second question, the environment. Uh, <clears throat> This does strike me as an issue which unfortunately up to now has tended to be framed in terms of a certain so-called business realism versus uh, hopeless idealism. And only now are we really beginning to get to a phase where A, the problem is undeniable and B, uh, the fact that some solutions actually work or have the potential for working is, is beginning to be clear. Uh, so the potential for uh, action on this front is now uh, uh, greater than it was. Uh, it still remains the problem that countries don't necessarily see the fruits of their own labors. And if you view states as on the whole self-interested entities, you have a problem in knowing where we're going. Um, with environmental issues, because we may reduce the CO2 emissions in the whole of the United Kingdom, but uh, that won't affect the amount of CO2, or not significantly affect the amount of CO2 we actually breathe in, in our, uh, our own land. So um, there, there remains a problem, which there may be ingenious solutions to, in terms of uh, uh, duties and taxes on environmentally wasteful products and so on. But uh, there's a lot of work still to be done on that. I do think uh, 
it is it has long been one of the most intellectually difficult issues faced in international relations uh andy harrell and ben kingsbury did a pioneering book about uh international politics of the environment in the 1980s and so we, we've been there before but uh there is certainly more work to be done on, on that and i think there's been a bit of a tendency to to let the problem lie now uh on europe i just uh, want since this is a, a week of extreme anxiety on the subject of europe uh, when uh, we and certainly not celebration we we don't know whether we're going to get e even the minor civility of leaving the european union with a trade agreement or not um, but uh, i do want to recall that uh, one person who one of the many who gave a lecture on europe uh, in the cyril foster series uh, was one chris Patton. And I'm going to read out the last uh, words of that lecture. Um, he said, let me conclude on a wearisomely familiar dying note. Uh, I, we have the fundamental and existential question, are we really a part of the European enterprise or not? Flying back from Japan recently, a stewardess paused in the middle of laying out my breakfast tray. Can I ask you a personal question, Mr. Patton? Certainly, he replied. Do you think, she asked, that we will ever join Europe? Quite so, Chris Patton responded. That is the question. And we now sadly have the answer. And I do think it's uh, partly a reflection of how we have failed to and fail even as a profession to get arguments across about the value of international cooperation and about the experiences which have made europe such a valuable and important project uh, we've we've not been very successful in the arguments on that front and we have seen the political consequences in the last few years and indeed in the last few days thank you Thank you very much, Adam. And um, to thank the participants to this round table, to the first digital round table of the Siri Foster lecture, Professor Janina Diel, Professor Rosemary Foote, and Professor Adam Roberts. I really appreciate, and we do really appreciate it, your interventions and, and the time you took for sharing these ideas with us. I really want to thank the audience who has been uh, after a very, I guess, long uh, Zoom fatigue uh, close to December, being able to attend and, and pose questions um, uh, uh, via the Q&A function. I also want to thank uh, the events team, in particular Hannah Vinton, for uh, having been a fantastic uh, support for making this possible. And, you know, we will rem remember these 20, 20 years as a unique year, we hope so. And we will uh, have also the footage of this round table. And uh, so thanks everyone. And uh, I wish you a lovely evening and also relaxing vacation. And uh, hopefully I will see you next year in person for our next Cyril Foster lecture. Thank you everyone, bye now.